All right, let's get started here this morning. Turn to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Glad you're well. See some folks that haven't been well, so to see you back is good. Michaela's back for a visit from the Wild West. Uh, oh, speaking of being back, some more college students back, looking smarter than ever. Uh, fun time of year. Glad you're here. Acts chapter 16. We're going to work through Acts 16 together. We won't have this equip hour for the next two weeks, and so you'll have time off uh, and can be plugging away at your own Swedish method, all right? Um, if you need a Swedish method form, uh, there's some on the back and there's some up here. You can grab them for your next couple of weeks off, uh, but we're just going to work through trying to analyze the text and using these picture icons to remind us of how to think our way through the text. So Acts chapter 16 uh, gives us the Christmas story, right? What must I do to be saved? That's still the Christmas story. Uh, call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And in Acts 16, we have Paul and Silas put in prison, and this great story of conversion. So if this were your Bible reading for today, you would read this text, as we'll do in a moment, and then you would have to think. You'd have to do something with it. And the Swedish method is one tool of many that you can pick up and engage your mind with the text. So... Let me read Acts chapter 16. I'll start in verse 16 and then uh, read a bit. And you be thinking of those icons. The light bulb is something to see. Uh, what stands out? What would I just mark? I don't have to have a lot of thoughts behind it. It just, it just we might say, it struck me when I read this. Uh, it stood out. Uh, then you think of the, the little uh, question mark. Uh, you read something and you're not sure what that means or why that was there or what it's intended for. What does that word mean? How is this connected to the previous paragraph? Whatever questions might come into your mind. You can think of the arrow. Do I see something clear here that, that I know I should do based on the text? Sometimes I, on this arrow, it's not even like I have to come up with an application, though that would be part of it. Literally, does the text give us an example to follow, a sin to avoid, a command to obey? Does it say, do this? Well, that makes it real simple to figure out uh, the arrow, something to do. Uh, then there's a few others that we can throw in there as well. The more you read your Bible, the more the little Bible icon is helpful, uh, somewhere to look. Where else in the Bible is there commentary that sheds light on this passage? How do I use scripture to inform me about what this passage says, to interpret this scripture? Uh, and then, of course, something to pray, someone to tell. Those are application-type questions. But I, but I also think if you could learn how to pray from the text that you read that day, uh, that will uh, rejuvenate your praying. It'll give it a fresh take each day to have to think through intentionally, what am I actually saying here? What am I asking God to do based on his word to me? All right, Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 16, Paul and Silas are giving us this account by the Holy Spirit. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, takes solace in that verse right there, <laughs> right? If you ever get annoyed, well, just know it's possible, perhaps, uh, Paul is greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, 
I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out, of, it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore their garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. But when it was day... The magistrates sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No, no. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. All right, great story. Sometimes when your Bible reading takes you in places like we've studied earlier this month, uh, Psalm 23, uh, it feels pretty easy to harvest encouraging stuff. You get into the letters. Paul walked us through uh, Peter, 1 Peter. Uh, again, uh, oftentimes the letters in the New Testament, it just it's kind of there. There's instruction, there's encouragement, there's warning. Uh, and, and it's designed to, to counsel the church. And so it's pretty easy to hear that and think, here's what I do. Sometimes when we read narrative accounts, it gets a little more challenging because we see a story and it's a long time ago and it's a good story. It has neat little twists in the plot, but then it, we feel like it's just a story. How do I take that story and then kind of feel something for me out of that? What am I to do with this story? So I wanted us to tackle a narrative account and, and see what we can glean here together as we, as we think through this story of the Philippian jailer. All right, so get us started. Uh, something stood out, something to ask, something to do. Roy, what, do, what can you help us with? Can we, can we look and uh, use this as a justification or a statement of what we should do if we run into demon possession? 
Two, he let this girl follow them around for days. So it wasn't a, I must cast this demon out thing. His spirit leading was basically getting annoyed and then casting the demon out. Which seems like it's his idea, not necessarily. I don't know. There's just a lot there that I don't know what to do with. So the text begins, they are going to a place of prayer. So here's the, they're on the right track. <laughs> they're, they're going to do something good. And yet, even the language of the narrative sets up the conflict. They are going, and they were met by. Well, this isn't, you know, you run into somebody from church at Walmart or something, and you're met there, oh, hey. No, th this is setting the stage for this spiritual battle, this warfare. Um, did it exist before Paul met the demon-possessed girl? Of course it did. But now it's been brought to the forefront, and now, now it's quite evident. Uh, they're going to the place of prayer. They're met by this girl with this spirit. Um, Roy, what was your first question, you, or the first observation? Right, okay. The, you know, is there something here that helps us understand how we would engage in spiritual warfare should it be made as manifest as it is here in the text? We're always engaged in spiritual warfare, right? Uh, Ephesians makes that clear. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's not Democrats or Islamic terrorists that we're actually fighting against, if we count those things as fighting. Um, we're actually warring against evil that's being uh, administrated by the devil and all of his spiritual forces. Ephesians 6 sets that battle up. It's a spiritual warfare. Um, when we start losing that warfare, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians that the enemy builds a stronghold in our territory, and we need to tear it down, um, not with carnal weapons, but with spiritual weapons. So it's a spiritual battle. We are in that battle, but what happens when that battle becomes very evident, it's manifest, it's made clear in a more visible way than we normally perceive it. Um, maybe you've been in some situation where that thought entered your mind, is this some kind of demonic influence that I'm seeing? I can't say that I would have any story to tell about a scenario where I feel like that was the case for me, uh, but I've heard people speak of it, not in spooky mystical language but is with the same reality that we would read here in the text that most of Paul's life was not lived in public displays of spiritual warfare but there were moments of it somebody yeah, I was just saying you've never worked toddler nursery <laughs> you're right I haven't <laughs> um, but that is a sweet opportunity for many of you you know uh, <laughs> right. Uh, okay, so as far as a precedent um, or a tool to help us, what, what would we glean from this passage regarding encountering some kind of very evident spiritual warfare? What's something that we could encounter or what else? I don't know about the encounter, but what she said is the truth. And, you know, she was saying these are the men of the most high God, so it's not necessarily what's coming out that is telling you that it's demonic. Okay, and so let's, there's another question for us. In verse 17, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Is all that true? So isn't she an ally? <laughs> Why in the next verse is Paul greatly annoyed and rebukes the spirit? Well, I think it's Satan uh, uh, planting the seeds of confusion. Yeah, clearly this isn't something Paul saw as advantageous to the spread of the gospel, to have another voice proclaiming this. There's some kind of antagonism. There's some kind of, maybe some kind of mockery. At the very least, there's, there's a confusion here of, wait a minute, which side are you on? And Paul's not going to have the muddy waters of saying one thing and yet, you know, being under a different authority. So, 
you know, certain names, so, you know, there could be some sort of doubt there. Sure, there, there's clearly something there that when you compare 17 to 18, Paul says, no, I'm not going to have this voice, even saying, these are servants of the Most High God who proclaim the way of salvation. Um, at the very least, we, we can know from the text that there were two authorities at play here. The authority of the gospel that comes from God and the authority of this spirit and whoever it reported to. Yeah, Ward? I think we should remember that Jesus did the same thing with demons were calling out that he was the son of God. He did not that. Right, so you could, as far as somewhere else to look, you could go to some of the accounts that Jesus uh, of Jesus in the Gospels and how he dealt with some of those who were demon-possessed. And at times, he silenced them as well and didn't need them saying that he was son of David or we know that you are from God or any of those things. Um, good, that's another good thought. And then when we're hearing someone speak and they're saying the right thing, we still have to be sensitive to is there something going on behind the scenes that would betray the motivation is that's being said of others? Right. So even if they're saying the right things, then what is the source of that? What is the motivation of those things being said? And ultimately, what authority? What we do know from the text is that we stand behind this shield of the name of Jesus Christ. At the very least, if we wanted to know anything about this encounter, it's that Paul wasn't out there on his own fighting some spiritual warfare. He immediately defaulted to what we might say of soldiers these days of the uniform. What, what, what's the flag on the shoulder? Or, you know, who do you fight for? Because there's, there's where the, the weight of authority and power is coming. So Paul is simply saying, listen, I'm... I'm engaging you in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, whether or not you feel you need to cast out or call out or dismiss or whatever, uh, you know, that's going to be the work of the Spirit in that moment should you ever be in that situation. But the reality is you will stand in the name of Jesus Christ if you are asked to stand in a manifest spiritual battle. Amen. That doesn't denigrate the fact that you said, I am a Jew. But then you reference that against the, uh, this kind comes out not accepted with prayer. I, I. Right. So Paul is saying, I, well, we know who he means because whenever he introduces his letter, it's Paul, I, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's a sent one. He's, he's a messenger. He's a soldier. He's a servant. Um, but Roy's referencing another text in the Gospels. I think it's after the Mount of Transfiguration. They come down from the mountain. Um, some of the disciples couldn't heal some, a son of somebody, perhaps, and asked, why couldn't we cast out or why couldn't we heal? And Jesus said, these things, some of these situations, you know, it's going to take prayer and fasting. It's not just have fun and enjoy being on the winning team. It's... No, there, there needs to be a, a deep understanding and uh, a willingness to yield yourself to this authority in order to see it manifest uh, as you would like. So looking at Paul's track record, though, I think it's safe to assume he was praying about it. Right. Because it had been happening for many days. So it wasn't just a whim that he just got annoyed right. that particular day. He had been struggling probably with it for days, trying to deal with you know somebody who was... Making a lot of money on fortune telling, drawing attention to herself when he's trying to draw attention to Christ and trying to deal with, how do we deal with the situation? So, I mean, his track record would indicate that he would, he's probably praying about it for a couple of days, right. trying to figure out what do I do with this? Yeah, I think we're probably safe to think that when we read many days of this voice, this confusion, this mixed message of authority, uh, many days and the greatly annoyed shouldn't make us think he's this cantankerous, you know, about to lose it, and he just blows up. Um, I think the greatly annoyed can still fit under a spirit-filled life. I, I don't think the text is 
making us go all over the map here. Um, I think we're in line with someone trying to do the Lord's work, engaged in spiritual warfare in a very evident way. Um, and elsewhere we might read in the, in the Gospels, you know, the disciples or Jesus was moved with indignation. And we call it like righteous indignation when we speak of it because we know he wasn't flying off the handle. This wasn't an angry outburst of a lack of control. It was very controlled. Uh, it's done in the name of Jesus Christ, but you get to the point where enough's enough. And there's times when, you know, our culture is doing something, and for a while we might try to, you know, okay, we're going to be patient here, and then eventually you just say enough's enough. Um, and that enough is enough kind of thing needs to be spirit controlled, but eventually it, it, it also needs to be enough. Jesus would say, eventually, you're casting pearls before swine, and you're not being wise, loving, compassionate, caring, or biblical to keep doing what looks like the Christian thing to do. No, enough. And, and let's get down to the stark reality of we are not on the same team. I'm choosing to serve the Lord, and you're not, and I'm not engaging in this anymore. Proverbs tells us, don't answer a fool according to his folly, or, or you'll become like him. Well, the very verse next to it says, answer a fool according to their folly, lest they're wise in their own eyes. So which is it? Do we answer the fool or do we don't? Well, at first we do, because we don't want them to think that's right. We want to establish what's true and try to help them see that. But if they refuse that, then the Bible says in the next verse, don't answer the fool. Stop doing that. Just stop. Walk away is what Jesus told his disciples. And shake the dust off your feet as well. We're not good at that because that takes faith. We think, oh, I'm going to talk them into it. Or if I keep doing this, or if I show a little more love, and what we're doing is saying, I know better. But we need the Spirit's help to know, when do we become greatly annoyed and say, enough. No more of that. Parents have had to do that with kids in their house. Some parents have had to deal with things harshly. Some have had to say, listen, if that's the way you're going to respond, then you cannot be here. Enough is enough. Those are, those are hard things, but those are the things Jesus was talking about when he said he came to bring a sword. And that sword would divide father and mother and child and sibling because Jesus is divisive. When you say he's the treasure worth giving everything I have for, and someone else says, Pfft, no, here's the good stuff over here. There's a divide. And, and we, we, we have to be ready for that by faith. There's nothing here that says be annoying yourself, be harsh and judgmental, uh, rush to make people know how right you are. No. Many days, as Dave brought up, the time was there, but eventually this is not helping. This is not facilitating the kingdom I shouldn't be spending my time belaboring this point with someone who will not cooperate or yield to truth. Roy? Um, I'd, I'd like to point out that, in, at least in English, annoyed is the lowest level word for anger. So we shy away from anger. <laughs> Generally, anger, we should be warned, but be angry and sin not can factor into our thinking and realize that, that we're just not good at being angry. We're not good at being jealous. There's a lot of virtues of God that we're not good at because of our uh, lack of perfection, our s state of being reconstructed towards that direction. So, yeah, I think we're rightly warned about anger, but in this text we're seeing there's something there that righteousness demands something a little bit more abrupt at times than, than always coming to the table in sweet, willing compromise, in, in you know, good compromise. All right, Zachary, you had a thought? Yeah, you're talking about the Proverbs. This is uh, the Proverbs uh, 18, um, 4 through 10, as you were just talking about. It says, uh, 
Doors of a mouth, uh, man's mouth are as deep waters, and a wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. It is not good to accept the person of the wicked, to overflow or to overthrow the righteous in judgment. A fool's lips enter in contention, and his mouth called for strokes. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are a snare of his soul. The words of a tailbearer are as wound, and they go down in the innermost parts of the belly. He also that is lawful in his work is brother to him that is great waste. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it in his sin. Uh, reference in to the Proverbs, and I remember reading that this morning, and that just hit it right on the point. Proverbs 8, 4, 8, 8, 8, 8, 4, 18, because uh, it's yet today's. So Proverbs 18, a whole paragraph on the voice of the fool, and then interestingly it ends with the righteous run into the strong tower, the name of the Lord. Our text, the fool clamoring with the words and strokes and all the language there of the words coming out, and we have Paul running to the name of Christ and finding that to be the high tower. So, good text. I was just thinking about how the whole city would have, at least the area would have known this uh, demon-possessed woman and would have known probably, for lack of better words, her handlers and would have known kind of what was going on, what cause she served, who she worked for, and just even like the association of her kind of <laughs> being the herald <laughs> of walking before them would have probably been um, challenging uh, just by association and, you know, our oh, is Paul with them or is this like, is this, you know, this is the new dog and pony show that's kind of a part and parcel with what we've already seen with this demon possessed mm -hmm. lady. Um, and then also just thinking about being annoyed, I was looking, doing a little word study there and just that it has the idea of accomplishing with great labor or managing a pain, um, less to do with anger and more to do with striving or almost being old English, being vexed. Um, which I think is kind of helpful too to see like that there's a labor involved kind of going back to what Dave said for many days um, that he's been striving in this way which I think is helpful for me. So just noting uh, especially that annoyed there has a lot of work behind it a lot of effort a lot of striving to you know get it right um, just helps us see like it's not a, we, a blow up because I don't like something. There, there was a long effort at this, the many days. There was endurance there, self-control, fruits of the Spirit being manifest, even in a word that looks like one that would contradict the fruits of the Spirit. So greatly annoyed, um, but, but keep it in the context of that verse. Greatly annoyed produced this rebuke in the name of the Lord. So... It's not a bad thing. Um, we need to figure out how to be greatly annoyed in, in kingdom advancing ways. And in our culture, that shouldn't be too hard. Uh, watch the news, see what the next legislation is, see what the next great movement is, and you should have some kind of annoyance that this, this kind of wrongness should grate against everything that we know. Um, so I, I think we can understand the word. Um, the hardest part of the word is recognizing that annoyance is governed by the Holy Spirit. So again, our walk in the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit daily becomes crucial because it determines whether we will be jealous rightly, whether we will be angry rightly, uh, whether we will speak and prolong conversations rightly, or whether we will cut them off abruptly rightly. Um, all right, so there's a lot there. Uh, including, you know, the age-old trouble of men, you know, using other men and women for their own gain, trafficking of all sorts. In this case, this spiritual ability 
demonically given, uh, was being capitalized on. Um, it, just, it just reminds us of the evil of man. Um, trading in human life is condemned in Scripture, listed in one of the lists of sins of those who won't in, enter the kingdom. Uh, so we can, we can rest easy knowing the Bible does speak to these great causes that the world wants to think they came up with. Um, but the Bible speaks to that kind of righteousness. All right, let's go down then to the, the account that we're probably more familiar with, uh, the guys being thrown in prison and what follows. What do we observe uh, moving on in the story? Yeah, David. Uh, I was just going to tie it a little bit to what came before. Because <coughs> um, we see Paul, uh, you know, being... They, they, this person's been with them for many days, this girl, and they called, oh, this is really silence, um, commands in the name of Jesus Christ. The next thing that we hear um, from them is their worship. They are worshiping and singing hymns and praising God in verse 25. That is their focus in this whole story is on the worship of God and proclaiming his goodness to others. The others in, this, in the prison were listening to them. They were singing hymns and, and praying together, not necessarily solely for their own edification, but it, like sharing the gospel that they had in another way with these people around them, showing them what it means to have heart worship toward God. Uh, and that kind of, you see that even starting with their interaction with the girl like this is something in Jesus' name we are casting out this, and now you know the next, the very next thing they're doing that we hear of is they're engaged in worship. So they're beaten with rods, inflicted many blows. Twenty-three verse twenty-four, fastened their feet in stocks, and now we have them praying and singing hymns to God. Um, and as David mentioned, the prisoners were listening to them. You know, we're kind of told that, so we don't know if Paul and Silas necessarily knew that. We're just told in the narrative the prisoners were listening. Um, so when I read that, I, I guess the words that came to mind were, you, you never know, right? I mean, obviously the story unfolds, and Paul and Silas knew all these prisoners were, were affected by what they were doing and saying, but they're kind of two different things. Paul and Silas are doing what they do. You know, they're struck with rods. They're being hit with the rods. But it's like, you know, when I drop my gallon-sized tea bag in the hot water to make iced tea, you know, it starts seeping out. Well, in order to maximize my tea bag, I usually get a spoon and I, like, start pushing the bag and I flip it upside down a couple times to get all, I want to, I want to get all the tea out of that bag possible before I send it to the missionaries, right? <laughs> Some of you haven't heard enough mission stories to know <laughs> what missionaries would get in the mail. Um, so I, I, I manipulate the bag and oftentimes I'm squeezing it against the side and poking it. Once in a great while I split it open and then I, you know, you get all the grainy tea in there, but um, I want to manipulate that bag. Well, so that all the tea comes out. Well, here, with every beat, every stroke of the rod and every punch and hit and every persecution they suffered, what's coming out of them is their mission, that God would be glorified. Um, so whether it's standing there face to face with this girl and saying, in the name of Jesus, as David said, there's that encounter, but the next encounter is really more the same. They're being hit, but with every blow, Christ is spilling out of them. And so they're praising God, they're singing hymns to God, and then we're told this other thing, that people were listening. Somebody noticed that. God was using that, we could say. They were planting seed and didn't even know it. So be encouraged this week. If you live a life intending to glorify God, if you're so filled with, with him, if the word of Christ is dwelling in you richly, so that whatever jostle this week comes, you're just kind of in that mindset of giving glory to God, you may not know 
but there might be a little bit of a zone around you where people are getting affected by this stuff about God. There may be a wake behind you of people that heard something or saw something. When you leave that job, people might think, man, that, there was something different about that guy. We kind of liked him. And, and it's just that sense that they, they noticed something. So at the very least, take heart this week that people are listening. It might be people you talk to that seem very disinterested uh, for a long time. Maybe you'll never know that they were listening. But just know the text says when we live our lives with this kind of intent, it'll be noticed. God will use that. You are doing what you are supposed to do, what we studied a few weeks ago. You're being the witness. You're letting it be known God is significant. And you can trust him that as people hear that, he'll he'll use that as seed or water for the seed, and he'll do his work in it. All right, what else? What else here in the story? Yeah, Zachary? Well, uh, just to add on this, this story is so familiar um, because it, uh, before I even read this story, uh, when I was in TCU uh, in prison, I did the exact same thing because I didn't know what else to do. I knew I was it's some more bad. I don't remember 12 days of my life. Um, and all I knew what to do was kind of reject some of the meds they were giving me. And those 12 days were the only 12 days that didn't have a Bible, which I was lost. But I did know the song Amazing Good. And um, I can only imagine. And I, my, my conscience from the medicine that they were giving me cleared up. In myself, I don't know how much louder I could have sang those songs because that's all I knew what to do. I didn't have, I didn't have, I mean, I was, I was, stripped, I was stripped of everything besides my spirit. Now, in doing that, not only an hour later, they transfer me. And it, this is like midnight. They don't do transfers at night. To some words where now I got a shirt, a blanket, a pillow, a window, a, yeah, all these other things. And it's That was before I even, and then, I don't know, it's, it's uh, it should be beautiful. Uh. Well, we have to remember, this is everyone's story. You know, Paul and Silas in a pretty rough place. Zachary saying he can identify with being rock bottom in a similar place. But the reality is the the details here aren't meant to say, well, if you're ever in prison, you know, that would be a good time to, you know. No, the reality is we were all prisoners. We were all destitute and had to come to the place by the conviction of the spirit of sin, of righteousness, of judgment to come, that we could only cry out and say, what do I need to do to be saved? And the answer, in a sense, is, Nothing. You don't do anything. You believe that Jesus has done everything. So believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's everyone's story. It just, we look at stories like this and we think they're so dramatic and, oh, you know, my conversion was so bland. But that's just not true. Um, See in this story your account and whether you can remember a moment, as some can, when you said, what do I have to do? to be saved and as we sing you know my chains fell off you may remember that moment when you were free but uh, whether it was that exact moment or the reality of it we had to come to the place where we said I I can't do anything 
but I can believe that Jesus has done it. All right, what else? Paul? I just was looking at, it's probably maybe falls in the question area, but um, at least what I've been pondering is that verse 28, but Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself, we're all here. Then you jump down to 30, and it's just this really kind of abrupt change <laughs> in the plot line of the story. Um, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And um, I guess it's kind of a continuation of what David was saying, that like, here they are, here's all this stuff, they're beaten, and then what comes out of them is worship. But that I think, it's pondering like, you know, what's the connection between don't harm yourself and what must I do to be saved? And I don't know that there is as much as that you rewind back that he's been listening to this same, we can assume anyway, that he's been listening to this same chorus, this same worship. And the fact that they're still sitting in jail, even when they've been broken free, um, is just so otherworldly to what he's seen and encountered in the past. I don't know, that's still kind of a question. That's what I'm pondering through. I'm just tossing it out to the room. But Here's a, here's a question. That maybe we can throw a few answers out to quickly, then I'll get to these. Um, I think we would be good to ask once in a while to remind ourselves when they say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, uh, what are we saved from? Let's, a little refresher course. What are, what are some words that you would complete that sentence? We are saved from what? From condemnation? From what else? Eternal damnation as the result of that condemnation. What else? Sin and death. Power of sin. What's that? The wrath of God. Yeah, so just that it's just such a familiar word that you'd be good to even think through those things. Hey, you'll be saved. Well, saved from what? Saved from... Falling on your sword, saved from your boss's anger if you let prisoner, you know, just think it through and even words you think you know, remind yourself. Because uh, we often can use that language, I got saved or something, and it just, it becomes an entity in itself rather than, no, the wrath of God and his just anger um, on my sin. That's why there's a consequence to sin, because there's a God. So... Uh, it just forces us to think a little bit. All right, um, Jonathan, and then a few hands here. I was thinking about the jailer's question about what must I do to be saved. And that's, <coughs> I was wondering his motivation behind that question a little bit, like just because the previous verses he is trying to fall on his sword. And I guess my mind goes to uh, the paralytic uh, who his friends bring him to Jesus. And they're not bringing him to Jesus to get his sins for him. They're bringing him so that he can walk again. But Jesus' first thing is your sins are forgiven. And then heals him so that he can walk. And I always wonder if there's a little bit of that in this Philippian jailer's question of um, he's about to kill himself. He knows that if anything, if the prison is escaping, the dead man from his eyes. Um, he's like, what must I do to be saved? Because I'm in bad shape here. And rather than say, well, what a, we'll, we'll stay in the prison so you don't lose your job. It's, you know, you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and what you say. That's what, that's what you actually need. You think you need us to stay in the prison so yeah. you don't die, but you need something far more. Yeah, it's a good thought to think of the story of the paralytic who was brought by his friends. The intent was they want him to be able to walk. They've seen Jesus heal, and yet he goes away with this forgiveness of sins as well. So how, does, how do we see that in this story when he's afraid of facing his superiors because of escaped prisoners, and yet that's not the concern of Paul and Silas. They're not telling him how to manage his jail to preserve his life. They're telling him uh, something far more important. Um, so that, that's thinking into this, the question, why did he ask this? So that is, why did he say, what must I do to be saved? What was he asking for? What did he mean by salvation? Had he heard something in their singing? Was, you know, there's all these questions that help us realize, okay, there's a lot there going on in this guy's mind right in this moment, and yet the disciples cut right to the chase, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Valerie, and then Donna. Uh, same, same question on why does he say, um, what must I do to be saved? Why is he asking that? Um, and he probably knows the whole case. He probably knows about the girl who is shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. And just like Joseph said to his brothers, what you intended for evil, God intends for good. And so she had announced, they're gonna tell you how to be saved. And now he, the jailer is asking the question, how can I be saved? And so God has used what was going to be, what was meant for evil, right. and he's turned it for good. Yeah. And that's a great connection to Joseph, even the very prison theme. Uh, that's good. Don? Well, when you read the whole thing, uh, the first thought is uh, that the Holy Spirit is saving Paul and Silas, but the target of the Holy Spirit is really the jailer. No, that's good. To see the purpose of this text is not to get, for God to get his guys out of jail. That's not his biggest concern. There are times he will do that for his purposes, and there are times he doesn't. Uh, earlier in Acts, Peter is delivered by an angel in the middle of the night. James had already been beheaded. He didn't get out of prison. So that's, God does what he does with his servants, and yet he's doing it for his purpose. Um, can we see a familiar word in verses 31 through 34? What's a familiar word or family of words that stands out? House, household. This text is often used as the, a marquee text for infant baptism. Because of the language here, you will be saved and your household. And then... Um, they were baptized at once, verse 33. He was baptized at once, he and all his family. Well, understand, uh, the text says that he was baptized and all his family, so he baptized the whole household, uh, is the argument. But I think if we look at what the Bible is saying here, there, there's more about household that we're told. So, verse 31, yes, you can be saved and your household can be saved, but verse 32 is clear that he spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in the house. So as long as when we're talking about the household is baptized, we're also talking about the same household that can sit and understand the teaching of the word, then I think your argument could work. So anybody that was in the house and heard the word would be eligible to be baptized. And verse 34 he brought them up into the house, set food before them. He rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. So the same household that's baptized, and we're told that's supposed to mean infants in, as well, well, as long as we're saying and, and arguing logically that those infants could rejoice at the conversion of a sinner and could respond to the teaching of the word, if that's the argument, then I guess you baptize infants. But I would argue that it's, it's quite illogical to say that we baptize infants because they belong to a household where somebody was converted. When the text is, is making it clear, the household sat and engaged in the word, and the household rejoiced at the conversion of a sinner. They understood what took place. So I've never been convinced by this argument for pedo-baptism and I would argue the other 10 references to baptism in the New Testament have allusions to faith as much as this one does. And so the weight of argument or proof for pedo baptism needs to fall on some other argument than examples in the Bible for its occurrence. Um, and obviously you may understand some more of that issue where it's more of a covenant argument regarding how much is baptism like circumcision in the Old Testament? That argument can, can carry a little bit more weight of dialogue, but I think Bible example is clearly on the side of credo-baptism, that meaning we baptize someone based on a profession of faith. So that's kind of tucked away in this passage, though it's narrative, this narrative is used for a lot of discussion there. Um, 
with obviously what I would call our brothers in Christ, certainly uh, even if we would differ on this matter of baptism. One last thought before we wrap up. What do we make of Paul demanding that the magistrates come down and personally release him from prison, right? He gets word that, hey, you're free to go, you know, don't come back, but uh, sure, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, just move on, move along. And Paul's like, nope, I'm going to sit right here and they can come down and I want to see them turn the key and open the door and walk me out of prison. What do we make of this? Daniel, then Roy? Um, from the get-go, the slave girl was running out in front of them, or, you know, who knows the mocking tone that was used in all of this, um, to kind of derive it. And they go to prison, which seems to have sealed them out, and now they're going to be released quietly without any explanation that's listed here. Paul's kind of saying, no, that's not justice. Justice looks like you absolving us of this. If you're going to release us quietly, you should release us openly. So again, I think it goes back to them looking to make sure that God is glorified the whole time because he's not looking for his absolution. He's looking for, hey, the message we brought still was valid. It was, it was appropriate. It didn't have anything that condemned us. Because that's what they were condemned for. Uh, uh, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. The acting customs are not lawful for us as the Romans to accept the practice. So that was a charge brought against them. And then they're going to be released quietly. Like, yeah. What do you Good. do? Good. Roy? Application. It. I mean, we, we tend to blur the lines about authority and we tend to sometimes uh, elevate authority figures, but at, at least here, and in, in, in this passage as well, at least in America and in this passage, the authorities do not have authority in their persons. They have authority from the law that they are subject to. So they use the law to rebut the authority figures. Yeah, I think law and justice uh, are the themes here. And at times, well, certainly in our times, our culture, justice is a big deal. Um, people are clamoring for justice, whether they really mean that or not. Um, but we need to understand that justice is, is God's idea. So uh, Paul's not wrong here to pursue justice. I don't think we have to, again, uh, find in here a warrant to do whatever we want. And because we're Christians, we should be... You know, Christians don't deserve tax exemption. You know, as a pastor, I don't deserve a housing allowance, uh, basically a tax kind of write-off from the government. They don't owe us these things. The heritage of our nation is such that with its Christian foundation, they recognize the significance of the church. And they said, we want to do everything to make that possible in our nation. So they didn't sanction certain churches. They simply said, Churches are going to receive this, this benefit because they are serving our society. That may all go away, and we don't need to be clamoring for justice in the sense of we should still be receiving that favoritism. Um, Paul simply here is recognizing the core of justice. And I think as Christians, we, we should be concerned about justice. Frankly, you know, if we're not careful, Christians in the church we sound like we don't care about justice when all we do is say, you know, we're not for this cause. Or, you know, what would you say? Black Lives Matter? Well, that, that, oh, no, we don't do anything with that. Well, wait a minute. Tackle that head on with someone and say, wait a minute. Are, are you talking about justice? And, and go after that and use what is true and right to, to engage them and remind them that comes from God who made us in his image. That's, yeah. I'm for, I'm for equal treatment. Yes, sir. And then, then press them and engage them, debate them a little bit on maybe where they went wrong on championing their cause. But be careful that we don't dismiss with some ideas that we might not like the good things as well. All right? 
So know where you stand on this and recognize, wait, I can be all for justice. That's God's idea. I can be for what's right, and maybe that'll make us a little brighter witness in our community rather than dimming the light because it looks like we don't care about justice or people. No, let's make it clear that we do, but for what reason? Uh, that's what seems to be lacking in so many of those conversations. So that's a great end of the story, uh, an exclamatory, no, let them come down here and let me out themselves. Uh, it just reminds us that justice is important. Uh, years ago when we studied through forgiveness, we realized that we have to be careful with our forgiveness that we don't undermine justice. Uh, we can't just sweep things under the rug at times or let bygones be bygones. It's water under the bridge. No, justice may demand things be dealt with. And if we can't get to that place, Romans allows for us to recognize I might not get perfect justice, but we should strive for it. And when we can't, then we leave it to God who will judge rightly. Uh, here, Paul was going to take a stab at, hey, if justice can be had, let's pursue it. That would be right, as Daniel used that word exonerated. It just, no, it would be good for what is right to be established here. Um, don't, ever, don't ever feel that that is a wrong response, but, but like the annoyance at the beginning of the story, submit your sense of justice to the Holy Spirit so that you're getting it right there. Uh, because oftentimes our sense of justice just kind of takes on our sense of me. <laughs> yeah, what I want. Um, I don't like something, and so I want my life to enjoy and be just right and ordered, and so I'm demanding justice. Well, submit that to the, the Lord and let him guide us. Uh, much here for us. Um, take this week, especially though, that theme of praising God for the good news we're celebrating now, knowing and believing that, as the text says, they were listening. Somebody may see and hear this week, whether you know it or not. Uh, share that good news. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. It instructs us again and again. Uh, we come to it thinking we were going to hit bottom in our digging, and we just don't. Um, thank you for its living quality, for its, uh, for its sharpness, for its ability to divide even our thoughts and intents. Um, we're glad for that, uh, lest we lean on our own understanding uh, only to find it insufficient to hold us up. We stand on your promises faithful and true. Uh, thank you for them. We rejoice in them now this morning. Amen.